So welcome to Two Month Review. This is our weekly video cast and podcast in which we talk about a single book bit by bit over a two month period. Right now we're discussing Gorgi Gospodinov's The Physics of Sorrow. And as always, I'm joined by Brian Wood. <laughs> and this week is a special guest. <laughs> Good, well played, and well played. And this week as a special guest, we have Tom Flynn from Volumes Book Cafe, who has been on the two month review several times in the past and is a good friend. How are you doing, man? Good, uh, good. It's, uh, it's good we're actually rolling with this thing finally this evening. Have we lost Brian or is he just, you know, being silent for <laughs> shits and giggles? I just figured with uh, him being from Michigan State, he should be used to failure at this point. So I was just being silent. I was so, I really wanted to get that dig in first. <laughs> oh, Brian. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drinking water right now. And in a second, I'm just going to down this entire bottle of wine and just call it a good night. So yeah, I figure just not showing up when it's time to be on is kind of a Michigan State thing. So oh, man, this is just getting worse. Coming I mean, through in the clutch. Just coming through in the clutch. <laughs> Yeah. How, how far are Rochester and Syracuse apart, by the way, anyways? Oh, fuck you. Annoying. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> not, not far enough. Not far so, enough. Um, we do have, before, in our early banter before we talk about the book, we do have one comment already, and that's from Tom Robert saying, Texas Tech, which is what we gave away last podcast, was that Tom had picked Texas Tech to win it all, and they are still alive in this strange March Madness tournament. So, Good job, Tom. Good, good, Props good to you. on you, Tom. Yeah, yeah. It's always good to be Tom, I feel like. My brother has all four of his Final Four picks alive. That's impressive. Is yeah, one of them Loyola? That means your brother knows nothing about basketball. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, is one of them Loyola? Because that'd be hysterical if he actually picked no, Loyola to go to the Final Four. That would be amazing, though. No, yeah. I forget. He has Michigan and Villanova and Duke and... What percentage of brackets are actually even alive at this point with Loyola making it to the Sweet 16? Like that, that, had, that had to wipe so much off the board. Yeah, but I mean, it does for everyone. So like right. you can still end up winning, but like, you know. Right. I know, I'm just saying in terms of like, well. you know, perfect brackets or even just brackets in general. Zero. Like, I mean, so, so many people have to be like almost be mortally wounded in their, in their brackets right now with like <laughs> yep. all the ups, all the like Virginia going down and like you know, Loyola making it this far and all that stuff, so. You know, Michigan Absolutely. State bowing out about when they were about to bow out. So, well, a fun uh, tie-in is the Buffalo Bulls actually won a game. It's very speaking, true. Speaking of, made to bring it back in. Yeah, I, back. I can't remember if I texted you that that night or not. But I, when I saw that, I was like, oh my god, this is a perfect tie-in to to physics. Who did, they, who did Buffalo play? Arizona. Okay, shoot, they're not. I was hoping it'd be like the Trojans or something, but okay, that doesn't work as well. That would have been awesome. <laughs> no, Wildcats. Okay. Although there's cat references in this yeah. chapter. We'll call them the Arizona Athenians just for the fun of it, and then uh, yeah. <laughs> the Bulls just just <laughs> um, rode right over them. The Bulls gored the shit out of the Athenians. So all right. <laughs> there's Tom, so you said cru- that you were some much much cruder references we can make on that front, but let's, yeah. let's shy away from those. <laughs> I'm I'm trying trying. Um, there was a uh, time or, or yeah, Tom. You said you were going to be drinking a special wine tonight to go along with the book, right? Yeah, yeah. I sent you a text of it last night. I was trying to think of what to drink this evening since we've joked in the past about having a drink during the podcast, but we usually record it at like ten in the morning. And you know, it's not that you can't. It just hadn't happened yet. So anyway, <laughs> right. um, I picked up uh, some Sangre de Toro um, wine for the evening which is really pretty dark when we consider all the horrible things that happen to bulls in this entire novel. But yeah, yeah that's why like. their wine blood of the bull. That seems just really the Spaniards, like who the <laughs> yeah. hell else would do that? Like, or the Argentines or, you know, pretty much anyone in the Spanish speaking world that's obsessed <laughs> with stabbing bulls to death. Yeah. <laughs> them. I'd, I'd hate people in my own. I know two. what the white blend is called. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> We're going to earn that explicit All right. label tonight. See, the real, <laughs> the real danger of doing this as a video chat is all those times where I put my head down and quietly <laughs> laugh at something, like, and then claim later that I wasn't laughing about it. Like, I can't I can't do that now. It's visible that I'm, like, losing my I'm, head. I'm sure it would be called the tears of the bull. I don't know where you guys are going with this, but, I, you know, blood and then tears, perhaps, would be the, the white. Absolutely. Speaking of colors, so the green box, is that where... 
<laughs> yeah, we're talking about the green box Second, this week. You were, you were fighting really hard, Brian, to get us back on track tonight. I'm trying is, to uh, segue the best I can. I, I was going to say I found a drink called the Minotaur. That was, was going to be my segue back to it. What is that? But it is it is with uh, gin, vermouth, oregano, and tarragon. What? Sounds like something a dude in suspenders is going to make for you and be all smug <laughs> about it. You're going to have a very nice mustache, though. <laughs> Yeah. According according to the according to the the ratings on whatever goddamn app website this is, it has a very aggressive attitude and a very savory taste. And the persona of person who drinks it is adventurous. <laughs> so, All right, an adventurous, God. aggressive person. I think I'm down. It's like tasting notes. That's so irritating. Like, yeah, yeah. The person so, who drinks I, this is very much into pomp and circumstance. What does that even mean? Like, what 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 is that? I mean, oh, anyway. <laughs> Have you read this before, Tom? I haven't actually. Um, I think you were talking about this with Tom in the first episode. Didn't it come out in like 2015 or thereabouts or something like that? Yeah, 2015, 2014, 2015. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that was right when I like, was briefly not working in bookstores and my uh, access Hated books. to discount and whatnot was uh, not existent. books. So, um, but yeah, I'm actually really annoyed I hadn't read it before because it's fantastic. I'm really really excited about it i'm really loving it i'm really loving like hawking it in the store so that's been that's been fun so have you gone gotten past this section no i did the same thing i did with the invented part where i just went up to this part and then stopped um i just felt like that worked well in terms of not knowing what was happening further along and not like also frankly confusing my poor wine addled yeah. brain with what we're actually talking about or not so yep. I have a question. How the how the hell do you hand sell this to somebody? What do you how how do you describe it or um how do I describe it? I mean, mostly I've been describing it as a, a broken narrative plowing through the last century in Bulgaria, but using the Minotaur as a frame. And okay. when they stare at me blankly like that, <laughs> I, I, I then launch into you know beautifully written it incredibly funny like all the things i just said to you shouldn't actually translate to a really funny really generous novel but it does like i mean it's it's really quite amazing in that respect i think so that's what keeps surprising me about it is how it's you know it's a it's a book about sorrow and just this crushing weight of all the different levels of sorrow and how it mm -hmm. can be but there's just humor all throughout there, it that keeps there's, surprising. Like a, there's a real lightness to it you know yeah. i mean like there's a way in which the prose almost like keeps you like skipping across the page and you're talking i mean and he, he knows how to slow it down for the sections where he really wants it to get darker and really emphasize that and i mean one of the things i say to folks is like this is as well structured and written a book as i've seen in some time just in that he's trained you to respond, the reader to respond to certain words. Like as soon as the word cave comes up or anything that like alludes to a cave or darkness, you immediately start to like make all the connections he's already established for you through repetition and through all that. Yeah. I mean, the connection to Greek myth is interesting in its own way, but in a lot of ways he's using a lot of those traditions and in, in how he's writing this and how he's building it out. So, yeah. Completely yeah. makes sense to me. I completely agree. I, this is one book that when we're talking about it and for this uh, series in the past, like I've usually tried to recap each chapter as we go along or each section. And it sort of worked even with like with um, Mercy Rodoreda's with Death in Spring. There's at least something that sort of like was a through line. And in this book that doesn't, this is a lot harder. This is a lot harder. I was thinking about it with this section that it's almost like these are very thematic and they're like almost meditations or parts of that of his labyrinth or of, of the text itself that are being built out that aren't necessarily, because they're not linear, because they're not just like one little story, it's kind of hard to summarize them. So I wasn't even gonna yeah. try it this week, unless one of you can. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know what? Not only can I not do it, I'm just gonna make an excuse for why it's not possible. I don't know, the only thing that occurs to me is this almost seems like the argument, I mean, he spent a lot of time previously arguing for the humanity of the Minotaur. Um, yeah. And this is the section where he's really aiming at the animal side of the Minotaur and how it is worthy of a level of respect or care or doesn't deserve to be killed and whatnot. And so if there is, there, if there is, I'm not sure how well that holds up or not, but if there is a thematic element to it, it might be that. 
I thought it went even further than that. And that it's not just that the the animal part is is worthy of being held up, but is the place to look for rather than looking to a human side. And like all the myths that we've had have had people eating babies, have had murder, killing. And like, and the big point of this chapter seems to be that animals wouldn't do that. Like if you base right. your morality on what animal, well, I mean, they do kill each other for food, but like if you base, a, base certain activities and your morals on what an animal would or wouldn't do, you end up in a better place than if you do it based on what humans would do since humans are like incredibly aggressive and insane. And even so far as like animals do kill each other for food, but like they don't do it by distance. It's face to face. It's almost more humane to like right. eat another animal than it is to like shoot a drone through someone's skull from like 500 miles away or whatever. Right. And you're right. That's exactly how he starts it off with discussing how the, you know, the change in warfare among humans. I mean, bringing it, bringing candy into it. And um, what was the precise line there? Something about yeah, the so full, it's the, 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 the full stop of the bullet, which arrives before the first word of the sentence. And juxtaposing yeah. that with Decius having to actually touch the Minotaur and look him in the face as he kills him. And then the next uh, section in the chapter is no animal would do that, I discussing slaughterhouses and all that, which is, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, I think that very much supports your argument, Chad. Good. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. You know what? I, 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 feel, like you, I feel like you need the win. I feel like you really needed a win. Just like I made a basket. I made, I made, one you for made a 14. basket. I mean, you're, you're, you're like one for two right now. That's way better than that 0 for 13 stretch y'all had. And that will be my last MSU joke before you show up in Chicago in a month's time. And like before you say anything, you punch me. So. Pour a malort down your throat. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> But that's also like related to your to, to the jokes about the Spanish and the and the, the wine, like the bullfighting situation. That is a bullfights are very intense, obviously, but there is like the the hand to hand aspect of it, which mm -hmm. is being contrasted here with the the remoteness of an impersonal nature of like a war, a modern war, with weapons yeah. that are designed to kill from afar. Uh. I guess I think he, but he does go right at the whole bullfighting thing in this section too, right? I'm not misremembering that. I mean, like where yeah, the, bull, the jumps into the into the crowd and he says that, like you know, thought it was back in the labyrinth, and if the labyrinth was there, then its mother needs to be nearby, and this whole movement back and forth uh, of that really, and and ultimately, like the yeah, let me see if I can find that. It's the very first part, and it is it is very much that, and looking for looking for his mother, that he's trying to escape to find his mother and to find. Right. Uh, within the, 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 what you'll call it, the labyrinth, which is the, the, I'm going to say Colosseum, but I don't think they use the word Colosseum, amphitheater, I guess. But Amphitheor, then there's a bit where, yeah. where they, uh, he changes like the cry of the bull from being like the moo to mom, which is a nice little, little twist there too. Yeah. yeah the labyrinth, One of the parts of like, yeah, the labyrinth, the amphith amphitheater catches that cry, ricochets it between the walls of its corridors, diverts it down the dead ends, cuts it off, and sends it back slightly disordered to the labyrinth of the human ear, like an endless moo. Yeah. Which is misheard as a mom, or could have been misheard as mom. It was his misheard as moo when it was a mom. And then, the, and then it goes right into that section about, like, without seeing his killer's face, um, yeah. and talking about the general history of, of murder and the idea of being able to kill... Um, and say things like in the face of death, but we don't see that. This is much more, much more uh, at a distance. And that's where you get into the, that an animal wouldn't do that. Right. And there's, there's a part that like on 155 is a section that I sort of like honed in on of the animal and me. So here's the new moral law side by side with the starry sky above me. The basic question, the litmus test, the divider between good and evil. Could what I've thought up be done by an animal? Step inside the skin of your favorite animal and find out. If it wouldn't do it, then you shouldn't do it either, or you'll be committing a mortal sin, a sin against nature. All sins have already been committed, but at least the boundary of the natural remains. Um, and then it talks about all that crazy slaughter of livestock, which yeah. is, I assume, pretty much verbatim. And reminded me immediately of, um, have you ever seen Errol Morris's First Person? No. It was like a... It was a short-lived, um, I mean, I don't know if it was short-lived, but it was like a series that was on IFC back in the day, back like 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, where it was Errol Morris like doing half-hour sort of features and just interviewing one person. 
And I think the very first episode, if not the first and the second, was about a woman who is like um, had autism and created like a more peaceful way for cows to be slaughtered because she was like very concerned working on this like I don't know how she like she was born on like a farm or whatever it was, um, but helped like design like the way that that cows are slaughtered now where they're kept in like little chambers where they have to walk around so they don't they feel comfort because they're closed in and they're not like exposed and then they're suddenly killed when they're like at their most peaceful um they made a movie about like, that with the uh, million dollar baby lady what was her name oh really uh, oh, really? yeah yes where yeah she plays plays that lady which it's a weird moral of the story so i'm, I'm supposed to get behind this she's She's the hero. The one, all, well, we're still going to kill them. We'll just do it more humanely. <laughs> we'll just be nicer about it. It'll make the meat taste better. She's a champion yeah. for making meat taste better. Yeah, you don't, want to, you don't want all that fear and panic to be in the blood of the beast. Then you're going to eat no. it. Oh, it's all, yeah. It's just being passed along. I mean, that is one of the things they keep saying. He talks in about that. Yeah. Repeating. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it's true. I mean, there, there are whole ways that they go about killing um, fish now to like shut down the nervous system faster. So, cause it'll, it'll alter the uh, color of the, the, the muscle huh. of the fish. If you don't, if you don't basically they do a thing or there's at least one type of fish. And this is like a thing I saw in like Bourdain one time where they pretty much like pull it out of the water and then immediately jam a metal rod down its spine to instantly shut down all connectivity. And that makes the meat better like it tastes better it has a better color as all those things but like the, the creepy part about that is how much trial and error do you go through to figure that out like yeah that that took some dealing with the figure precisely how to do that and yeah i mean and i think he pushes that point in this chapter where you know going towards vegetarianism and discussing that you know the vegetarian man eater which was interesting <laughs> <laughs> which is which was pretty funny too yeah that's a, i mean it's all like part I mean, of that, that, that's, that, i mean that's like it's not even like it's a morbid joke it's just generally funny how he goes about doing a lot of this but yeah it's also pretty pretty intense and pretty yeah it yeah. makes you wonder wouldn't it be like very hypocritical if a veterinarian eats meat I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting question to like parse out a little bit. Is yeah, it? like you're going like, mean, are, 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 to fix my pet rabbit and then tonight you're going to have, you know, Hassan Pfeffer or something like, wait, wait a second, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, there, there, there is a certain, a little bit of an element of that. But at the same time, like my, um, my father-in-law was a teacher for a long time and then took his retirement and went and worked on a hog farm. And he would give the hogs all their shots and do all those things. And then part of his bonus each year was to pick, I think, one or two of the hogs out, and those were his. And mm. he got the meat and got the sausage and got all that. And when I started dating my wife, she didn't want any part of it, but he thought I would like it, and I did. And so he would send it um, our way. I mean, but there is the argument, at least as far as the farmer goes, that they're still make, they're making full use of, the, of what they're raising. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's... I'm curious how many people would eat meat if they actually had to do the slaughtering themselves kind of a, like i don't well, know maybe it goes back to like that whole marx like, thing like the, the further away you are from the actual things you're consuming you're going to be comfortable with it and the closer you are sure. would you be more uncomfortable i wonder it's a lot it's a lot easier to kill people through a <laughs> computer that you're controlling than it is to <laughs> shoot someone in a war too yeah i mean that's certainly yeah it's just funny, like there's all these things that confront me in my life that I should be a vegetarian and I, I dabble in it, but I just I really like meat and I, I have a hard time giving it up all the way and everything tells yeah, me I should. That's, that's pretty much where I'm at at this yeah. particular moment. I don't eat anywhere near as much meat as I used to, but. Yeah, even freaking Genesis is a garden, you know, it's not a slaughterhouse of Eden. <laughs> God, God's perfect harmony in Genesis is vegetarian it's like oh damn it it's everywhere <laughs> oh, but the genesis doesn't outright say that that's the case i mean there, there is no necessarily a, a strong description of how they ate 
I mean, for all we know, it's like the galaxy at the end of the universe and they can, you know, sure. <laughs> take off whichever pig they want and it like regenerates the shank you took off or what have you. I don't know. Like, go maybe, on maybe, maybe, the, maybe, go maybe on the garden. Maybe, the you know, back. We're getting really far off from this, I think. But like, you know. I don't know. <laughs> And it's all dealing with morality. We're all still in the same place. Yes, of like morality, this, this, vegan. Yeah. Well, it's, I <laughs> mean, it's also a function of like, what is, what are humans in this context? I mean, we are, because of a lot of the things that we do, we very much set ourselves apart from what would be considered a natural order. Mm -hmm. But does that, does that mean that we're no longer part of it? Does that mean we, we are omnivorous? I mean, that's part of, that is also, I mean, we can choose at this juncture, we can certainly choose not to be. But part of the reason we are what we are is that we started eating meat. Like that sudden like influx of protein helped feed the expansion of our brain pants and our you know, intelligence and whatnot. But yeah, we can choose to walk away from that now. And a lot of people do. I don't know. I don't know. It's... And then they start saying things like uh, dinosaurs were pets of giant humans. Yeah, I gotta tell you that the, the yeah, a lot of the a lot of the vegans and flat earthers I run into on the, on the <laughs> occasional basis drive me home. It makes it easier to have a steak at night. I'll say that. <laughs> Out of curiosity, it made some of the, the listeners as well. Um, have you guys all eaten oysters before? Yep. There's actually I was going to mention this. Chad, there's a place <laughs> down the block from the store that does really good oysters that we should hit oh, when you and Marie are in town. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm not an oyster fan, but I've had oysters you, before. You might be after this. I don't like seafood stuff at all, really? generally. Yeah, I'll mm -hmm. eat mussels. It's um, funny because I love oysters, and then the oysters, oysters are great. Mussels. There's obviously the fantastic description of the oyster in this book. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> pretty unnerving. Going I was back actually thinking to about making like I was actually thinking about making like writing that section out and just handing it to the bartenders at this restaurant. And just oh, man. See, see, seeing, we'll see whether they serve me anymore or not. This, they should make an oyster shooter and call it a Kronos. Oh, Wouldn't that be a cool thing to have on the menu, though, wow. a Kronos? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd order that just for the name. Yeah. That sounds pretty cool. A Kronos shooter. <laughs> oh, my God. Back, it sounds awful when you say it out loud. <laughs> a Kronos shooter. Oh, God. <laughs> going back to what you were saying about, like, um, eating meat, making us more, making us human and giving us the expansion, the brain panel, the, that kind of stuff. The other part of this, this chapter that seems to be the kind of connecting tissue is that um, there's a morality of like, what would an animal be able to do if you could or you couldn't, blah, blah, blah. But then what makes us human is also the idea that we make things that are last beyond our death or that we're, we're more obsessed with that or more and give that a value. So there's a whole section where he makes up that the philosophical conversation about like, what if it had all been reversed? And what if instead of like honoring things that were long lasting that would extend beyond our, our lifetimes, we instead focus and cherish things that were like ephemeral and fleeting, like cherry blossoms that bloom for a minute and are gone or like fruits or whatever that can keep regrowing and that can keep regenerating. And that instead of being obsessed with monuments and like lasting structures that can continue, we were, had always we had as, as humans evolved into appreciating and being more involved with like the short term things, the things that will go away, which does seem to be another ties into that idea. Like animals have some stability, but not entirely. Um, I guess, and that 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 is something that sets us apart from other other. Why don't you just go to a poetry reading if you like that kind of stuff? Because <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's only like just describing poetry. It's true. The cherry blossoms. You know, it took me ten years to write this stinking poem about a cherry blossom, but I got it perfect. So I can, <laughs> the haiku. Or and then you, and you write it. It only exists as one, and you read it, and then light it on fire, and it yeah. goes away forever, and enters yeah. into the the brain pan of the universe. But you hold, but you hold it as it burns, so that all you have is like <laughs> yeah. the little edges, as like a gust of wind lifts the ashes up in the air, which you then inhale. I did I circle tried. this thing <laughs> on page one seventy. Oh. Page 173. <laughs> oh, dear. That's a very know. inside joke. Oh, but re real, real quick, sorry to cut you off, Brent. The Socratic cool. part, the like, Socratic dialogue thing, what I loved, yeah. part of what I loved about that was as a callback to um, like 50 pages earlier when he's talking about the novel being a mission, like Gostine saying that, uh, you know, he doesn't want his novel to be Aryan. He wants hexameters. He wants Socr Socratic dialogues. He wants all this stuff. And then since then, he's been playing out all those various forms. And this is, yeah. this is the dialogue cropping up. And this is so tightly written. 
it's really quite remarkable. I think. Yeah. With the quote from Gustine at the be at the beginning of it, if yeah, everything lasted everything. forever, nothing would be valuable. Yep. Hmm. I disagree. But the the last part of that, or there's a a list of things that are perishable that he that he goes through, and then on middle of 173, it says a perishable shriveling rotting deteriorating and thus wonderful world and i thought man that'd be a great nine inch nails album title <laughs> it seems like absolutely perfect it really does yeah how's that not a band like industrial or metal band or i nerd rock ju- bands i immediately jumped album. to the johnny cash cover of that song on the album and oh, like, the his, hurt? Little, or his, his, his twang going out over a perishable shriveling Rotting, <laughs> deteriorating, wonderful that's world. Wonderful world. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, that's my Johnny Cash. That's how terrible it is. <laughs> that's awesome. <clears throat> I like, I, I, have to, I have to bring this up too. So, because of something you mentioned, Brian, that on 166, there's the bit about um, how to tell all the world's classics retold by animals for animals. <laughs> it reminded me of your <laughs> student who wanted to retell, like, all of his stories from the point of view of animals as well. Yeah, they man, they get a voice. <laughs> the fish, the dragonfly, the weasel. <laughs> Which it I it didn't, occur, it didn't occur to me until just now, but do you think he re- specifically references the old man to see because he's talking so much about matadors earlier and Hemingway's? Like, I mean, this is probably a complete yeah. overreading, but like, he's been a, he's been spending some time doing some talk about matadors and whatnot, and. I mean, Hemingway was all about that, yeah, shit in Spanish culture. So I don't know. Just it just sort of jumped at me this time seeing the old man to see reference there. That does make sense. <clears throat> and it does tie into your fish story too. Yep, sure does. It's all just a perfect circle. A, a perfect ephemeral circle. Perfect Things that don't circle. last. The cockroach part. There's a lot of stuff in this chapter that the 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 oyster part's a little gross, but then the the cockroach stuff is a little gross too. Because I'm terrified of cockroaches. Really? Yeah, I don't like them at all. They well, gross no me like, out. No one really no likes degree. them, but like, why are you terrified of them? Terrified I don't, is a pretty strong word. Terrified. I don't want to be close to them in any way, shape, or form. I would rather they didn't exist. There was. I stayed one time. I stayed in New York. One of the first times I like rented an apartment for two weeks and stayed there when I was working for Delkey. The first night I was in the apartment, like I had my contacts out and I hadn't gotten my glasses. And I was like, what's that thing on the ground? And I got my glasses and they're like three giant cockroaches that were like crawling across the ground. It's like, never again. I'm never studying foot. Like I'm not going to step on the ground. You broke, up a cock- you broke up a cockroach orgy. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but no, I don't, I do not dig them. I don't dig their existence or their idea of them at all. You'll love this cockroach story. Then I'll, I'll give you my one cockroach story. I was in uh, West Africa and I saw the biggest Those cockroaches, cockroaches are small though, right? No, this is the biggest cockroach I've ever seen in my life. And I was like, holy crap. I, I, I took a picture of it and it didn't look very big in the picture. So I put down one of those like thick pieces of gum, like the 18 pack of Wrigley gum on the oh, ground. Yeah, yeah. And the cock, so like for a reference, and the cockroach got on top of it and I took another picture, but you couldn't see the pack of gum because it was bigger than the 18 pack. Oh, oh, hell no, no, absolutely <laughs> so not. So no. I stepped on it and my foot didn't hit the ground. It stopped on the cockroach and didn't make it all the way to the ground. And, and it scurried off kind of like it didn't, I couldn't kill it. And I felt terrible. <laughs> One, I maimed it and didn't kill it. And then just the fact of smashing something, but not actually being successful at smashing because it's so thick. Oh my God. It was like a, it was like a king size. It was like stepping on a king size Snicker bar. Like, <laughs> I, feel like I feel like we're going to get a really upset email. Or text tomorrow, Over Brian, from Chad yeah. about like what a terrible <laughs> I, night he had. No, I didn't get any sleep whatsoever. No, I assume everything in Africa is trying to kill you. I assumed, and that thing was would crawl down. Australia, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, Australia definitely. That's yeah, Australia. <laughs> that continent does not want any humans there ever. During his circumstances, for the most part, it seems. There's, wasn't there wasn't there some crappy movie from the eighties like oh like Joe's apartment or something which they had a yeah, ton that of was based off of like a wasn't that based off of like an MTV like MTV set of skits film that they did 
Like it was like, um, it wasn't even a full show, was it? It was more like almost like the Eon Flux kind of like short films. Yeah, I think deal. it starred Jerry yeah. O'Connell. It did. The, the movie starred Jerry O'Connell, um, which I, why I know that, I don't. I, I remember his remember name, but not Academy Award, Award winner Hillary Swank. <laughs> that's, that's how terrible I am at remembering stuff. <laughs> But you know, sliders, Jerry O'Connell, remember that. Um, you, you, you got his entire filmography like on lockdown. And when that comes up in trivia, you're the guy. Yeah, he, he was the he was the fat kid stand by me. And yes, he was. Now he's like some weird, like weirdly healthy. It looks unhealthy. He's so healthy. And you, so. And you know who he's married to? No. <laughs> Rebecca Romaine. Rebecca Romaine, not yeah. Stamos. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Stamos, that's a Greek last name. Let's get back onto the... <laughs> wow. All that right. was a good sky <laughs> version. You, just led you that are, back you are right draining them from all over the court tonight, man. Like, you're just wow. crushing it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like Draymond Green, the guy from Michigan State that can win. <laughs> <laughs> do not do that when I've got wine in my mouth, Brian. <laughs> God damn it. Oh. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, all I, all I, yeah, I'm one, my one basketball comment that is, that is the yeah, anti, I, 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 I wow. don't believe this is your one and final <laughs> basketball comment, but okay, is that, let's, let's hear it. Is that given everything that's happened in the past two years and through this tournament, we are going to end up with a Kentucky Duke final because that is the shit that we deserve to live in. And that it'll be, and everyone, everyone will be miserable and it'll be awful. And that's just what we're going to get out of this. You know, I just realized on page 156, he, he talks about how you're supposed to kill a bull and also how you're supposed to kill a calf. So it's even yep. just, again, like oh, the, yeah. the freaking subtleties that this thing has of, again, like the, the killing of children. So even yep. when like a baby bull, there's a different way to like, it's terrifying, but very, very beautiful the way this is put together. Very freaking smart it's really annoying yeah i mean and like you said like you said he at the bottom of the page you know when discussing how to do the calves he has he has asides throughout this you know reproduction mm -hmm. of Emmanuel and the one regarding calves and the parenthetical is man really has thought of everything with reference yeah. to the fact that you have to aim differently to hit the the calves yeah. brain properly because the portion that you would aim at in the bull is underdeveloped in the calf yeah so it's that portrait's unnerving too like the little brain and the next page and then the the dash lines to show where the arrow is them. really messed up like i yeah. get it but at the same time it's like that's really some dark shit that's actually like hey if, uh, if you guys want to make a tote bag for next year's awp or something or a t-shirt do that picture. oh yeah oh god the chad, physics of sorrow please please chad do it do it because that I'm, would be I'm, great you, but you also need to live stream the unveiling of it on, on the conference floor and see what happens. Like, dude, you got some, between that yeah. and the road of the death and spring coloring book, you guys have some messed up texts. That's true. <laughs> we could, uh, we, we could put those, those are amazing other. sidelines. Chad, we need to talk about yeah. this because I'm, I'm seeing a new revenue stream for open letter opening up. <laughs> we've, been, we've, been, uh, we've been talking. We just need to actually do it now. <laughs> we need to, yeah. we need to make those things happen. Absolutely. There is too, like what you're saying with the calf and the, the adult bull interaction there. There's another bit to that, that this starts to flip at the end when it starts talking about um, his wife being pregnant and baby being born. And yeah. the idea that the baby is coming is coming is, um, is it Theseus? I remember that right. Coming out of the, yeah, here it is. That which was roaming around inside was not the Minotaur, but rather that which would kill him. Let's call it Theseus for the sake of clarity. The umbilical cord is there like it was Ariadne's thread. So then where is the minotaur? The answer lay in the anxiousness of the inquiry. The minotaur was me. And so in that sense, it starts to reverse a lot of things in this chapter too, of asking about that. We were talking about the minotaur, minotaur being emphasizing the human part before, and now it's sort of emphasizing the animal part. And instead of like the killing of the child, you've got the child killing of the adult or the parent um, and sort of usurping him. And even like, um, it's not particularly... Uh, I don't know. No, I don't know. But there's on 177. There's a part where he's talking about writing the world's sorrows and saying that she comes to me at two and a half and suddenly snatches away my pen. Is sort of that usurping or that that sort of killing of the mm -hmm. of the writing or attack on the adult versus where we've had all before this through all the Greek myths, all the the adults like <laughs> beating the shit and eating their children. Yeah, and she tells them 
she's pregnant as he's eating what he describes as a fetus, right? With the oyster. <laughs> yep. Yep. Why do you laugh every time we talk about eating babies, Chad? This is a very serious thing. <laughs> because ever since we said that, ever since we talked about it, the whole time that Alex said, holy mo, he's like, oh, I just want to eat up your little fingers or eat up your little toes. And people say it constantly. It's yeah. kind of I just amazing, not isn't it? How, that. How, how, much can, like, how much conversation to children is like based around consumption? Like, it's, really, really, it's weirded me out for the last few years, especially like I'm child number two and three. And just like, <laughs> I, you know. Oh, you smell so good. I want to eat you up. Uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um. um. <laughs> That's cute. Um, don't I'm going to take your nose and eat it. There's all sorts of like, it's just maniacal. <laughs> like, and that's why every time we talk about it, it makes me laugh because I notice it constantly. Parents are way into that. Yeah. Like, what is it about trying to steal my nose and make me think that you ripped my nose off my face? That's funny. Yeah. How is that cool? <laughs> when does that get funny? Cool. Who is that funny for? <laughs> for drunk, <laughs> for, for grandparents that smell like bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Jesus. I don't know. Is there any other section of this that you guys wanted to? Oh, there was one other section I liked. Was the was the kind of uh, the the difference between I love natural history but not as museums, and that nothing seems natural in the natural history museum. I do like that that idea too of of those two things being separate and obviously separate, but obviously like related. I really connected with that part. Um, I, I had never gone to a zoo as a kid. And my first time going to zoo, I think I was 19 years old, 18 or 19. And I don't know. I'm not an adult at 18 or 19 necessarily, but I'm, I'm definitely not a kid. And I looked at it very different. Like it was just so sad. You go to a zoo and, oh man, I don't know what I was expecting, but it was an awful experience. I hated it. Hated it. <laughs> So you guys don't have a zoo membership here in town? <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. But yeah, uh, my my grandparents just took uh, my kid to the zoo. She's three, and she had a good time. She loved it. Thought it was fun. But just I guess just doesn't realize they're all caged and sad. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we went to an interest a cool zoo in uh, Valencia actually. That was like not called a zoo. It was like a bio park where. It was based around the idea that they had like a huge amount of land and that you were stuck on the paths through like the different aspects of it. So the animals could technically like roam in between, but really didn't. I don't know if they actually could in the end or if there's ways that they were blocked off from one another, but they, it seemed like they could, but they retained, they stayed within their sort of natural habitat and you were sort of the visitor through their part rather than seeing them in cages. You were the one that was caged, um, which is really you know, just an inverse. It's really the same thing. It <laughs> doesn't right. make any difference. It makes you feel better, but it's the same fucking thing, right? Um, but it it's was pretty cool. have, well, Like when they have those prisons that are actually those tents, those tent camps where they work, it's not a prison. <laughs> no, like, no. <laughs> yeah. They're sleeping in cots. There's no bars. <laughs> but if you try to leave it, it'll fucking kill you. <laughs> same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Yeah. I've seen Cool Hand Luke. He doesn't make it out alive. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Not a zoo. Oh. It's still a prison. <laughs> <laughs> it's still sad. Fair enough. Other than, yeah. Yeah. No, while we're there, um, I put a box around that one of those parts. And it was my one of my favorite sections. Uh, I just thought it was very sad and very funny. Kind of, you know, that that Morden style that uh, Gospodinov seems to have. Uh, it's on one, 163. Uh, it says, during World War II and the period between 1940 and 1944, in air raids on European museums, 17 dinosaur skeletons were destroyed. I can clearly picture those double murders, the crushed dead bones, the toppling of these Eiffel Towers of ribs and vertebrae. No animal would do that. To kill someone who had already been dead for millions of years all over again, to reawaken that prehistoric horror in the black box of its skull. That part's awesome. Like, yeah. that's really heavy and sad, but there's something kind of, like, it's laughable when you think, like, oh, they're blowing up dinosaur bones. Like, what the hell is wrong with people, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> But, it relates to the part where it's like, there's no one's ever, the next section, I guess. It actually, has anyone ever counted the bodies of animals killed during wartime? <laughs> Which, 
which is true. This is going back to in the intricacy of how this is plotted. The ending of the last section that we talked about had the whole thing about two thousand dead blackbirds falling from the sky, right? And all, on the all, all, the, all the signs of the end of the world. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Exactly. Bees. Oh and god! The, and then, yeah. the, and then the title of this section that we're reading from is anti-anthropocentric notes, which is also like again, you know, oh, right. outside of the human world, the human age. That's interesting. That is very well put together. And this is a book that just does grow. Each of those layers sort of builds on top of it because you create those connections and you set forth this sort of the main ideas, the pillars on which to build this book. And then each one of these new sections kind of adds to that or refers back to you those different things and plays with those ideas. And I think that's why it's really ripe for being reread or re-talked about in this way. Well, I would also it say, go Chad, this is not the only one of the books that we've done on this review that's like that. I mean, you guys yeah. tend to put out books that are, do precisely that. They reward rereads and you know revisits and all that. Like you see things that you don't see the first time around. And yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, good on you. You get good days. We just have to, yeah. We just have to convince everyone that you have to read every book twice. But they have to buy if it. If you twice. buy this, uh, we'll repro do, do it in a different cover. Well, yeah, pull, pull, buy pull this my one. Blue Heaven. I might want to read it five times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, um, the Pavich book, um, Dictionary of the Khazars, that has the male version and the female version? You guys remember this or seen this? It's called, yeah, it's no, called, I, I remember hearing bizarre. about it. I don't think I've actually ever seen it myself, but like, I could grab it, but it's over in the other room. Um, but yeah, there's like, there's a male version and a female version of the book and you, they're printed separately that are different. And I guess there's really like a few differences, but most of it is based on one paragraph. And I think it's, um, changes the point of view of that one paragraph. So depending on which version you read, you have a totally different relationship to that crucial oh. part of the book. Um, and that way, yeah, and people have to buy two. You have to figure out what, what, what the difference is, right? That's how you should have, uh, was it the, oh, no, was it, I'm blanking on it. The, you have, you guys published one that is. The canvas. Which one? Yeah. The canvas. Yes. That's how you should Where have you sold can, it. You can read it either side. Uh -huh. Yeah. Although, it would be, I mean, it would be two different books then. I mean, the, the great part of that was that. You had to start on one side or the other, and depending on whatever you started at, would taint the way that you read that book. And uh, you could read it all one side and then flip it over and read the other person's perspective or go back and forth. But no matter what, no matter what choice you made, that would alter the way that you thought of the book as a whole. Yeah. But all I'm saying is you could have sold it twice. Yeah, we could have sold, if we could have sold it choose once. Your, choose your nice. own adventure in a, you know, translated <laughs> literature format. <laughs> we, got a, we, got a, we got a pitch for a book exactly like that the other week, by the way. When I was a kid, really? the first time I read a choose your own adventure, I didn't know how they worked. And I just read it straight through. It was <laughs> <You're> <laughs> like, I thought like those fucking weird. <laughs> I'm like, man, I I know I have bad reading comprehension according to my testing, you know, but boy, this is really bad. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> it was a book I bought off of one of those bookmobiles, you know, where they come to your school and get you all excited about books. And it was about Batman. <laughs> And like in one minute, he was trying to find the Riddler, and then the next page, like two faces in jail. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on at all. <laughs> None of this makes sense. <laughs> it's like it's like a it's like a mystery inside of an enigma around a box. It's I was like, like poetry. Yeah, I was twenty. I was probably twenty four. I think when I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, before oh. before I forget to mention it, Chad, this is the second time that I've had that I've. That I've been on this that we've been dealing with some really screwed up bull or cow or bovine animal <laughs> well, right. of some type. That's, so that's right. God no, what the hell, man? <laughs> like well, well. Oh, that's right. He has a drink in here called the green cow. And this Is book. He really? Yeah, remember we were trying to come up with a drink for the uh, the karma crazy green cows? Yeah. Yeah, and there was there was a drink in here last section that was called the green cow. It was like I totally creme de menthe and something right. awful. But oh, oh shit, you're yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, well, yeah, uh, the, the, the drink they made that's really funny. P page one twelve. We sat down, poured ourselves green cows, creme de menthe with milk. That sounds filthy. So <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna drink those when Rodrigo's in town. <laughs> yeah, that'll be the perfect. <laughs> that'll be perfect. Uh, 
That's oh. so funny. Like you did, you keep getting bull sections. Yeah. House yeah. sections. Really, really excited about it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep sounding them. I'm really oh, looking forward man. to like the next, I'm looking forward to the next one you pick and you figure out how, how to, you know, get me. Yeah, there has to be more bull stuff. I don't, can't even think of anything, but there must be. There's someone did make a comment too, by the way, of a way that you can pitch this. Um, they, it, someone uh, was talking to their six year old, their six year old asked if they were reading, told them the title, and he talked about the bull on the cover. After that, all he landed on was, it's about a sad bull, like Ferdinand. <laughs> so you can use that. Wow. There we go. I don't know what Ferdinand is. Is that a uh, Ferdinand the bull. cartoon? No, it's, it's a classic it's a kid's book. book. Yeah. Oh, see, I, I barely got through the Choose Your Own Adventure Batman book. So technically, Ferdinand <laughs> predates that in the reading experience, but you know, it's cool. <laughs> These I'm trying, own. man. I'm trying. You go either way you want. The, the struggle is real, Brian. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> I I'm just glad this one has pictures in it. It's keeping me. It's keeping me. <laughs> kind of like wakes you up a little bit, right? You turn the page yeah. like, oh, a diagram. Oh, a picture. oh, Bob, what are they Not doing to that pole? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So I don't know. Do you guys have any other sections that you really wanted to touch upon? Uh, he does say the, the narrator chapter. in this uh, has size 12 feet and did step on things and kill them as well. So I'm not the not only one that, that accidentally murdered things with their feet. So Fair. I feel I'll sleep okay he doesn't, tonight. He doesn't talk about giant cockroaches murdering though. Yeah, it's like ants. a million, one cockroach or a million ants. So I, I did the one. It's like the trolley problem. <laughs> <laughs> You saved a million ants by killing yeah, one know, big God, cockroach. Really, <laughs> made that choice. <laughs> the trolley it was a moral. It was a moral action. Yep. Would a, would another animal have done it? Yeah, probably. They they just kill all the cockroaches. You know what? Screw but... that. I was watching Blue Planet, and there was the stupid killer whale. That it was a it was a mama humpback whale and a baby humpback whale, and it they carry their calves around for like two plus years before they give birth, and like it's this poor little baby, and there's this uh, pod of whales show up and they start like stressing out the mom to separate the two. And then they jump on the baby to drown it. And they're like trying to like push it under the water and the baby's trying to survive. And so they murder this baby and then they only eat its tongue and part of its jawbone and let the rest of it just float away. So they don't even eat the whole thing. So animals, oh. ass animals suck too. They eat babies and do terrible things. It was so sad. I felt, I was like weeping, like, no, like Free Willy's killing a baby and like like separating it from its mom and drowning it and like it was so just mean in the way it did it. It was awful. <laughs> yeah, man. Killer whales are mean. <laughs> oh boy. You know what? Man. I'm glad you're I'm glad you're dead, Shamu. Take that. And all the people that have your stuffed animals. Screw you guys. Bunch of baby killers. <laughs> I can't decide if that's how we should end the episode or if we should spend like two minutes talking about something else as a palate cleanser or what. <laughs> you got to pick your favorite. You got to tell me your favorite line. But yeah, animals oh, wouldn't right do now. that. Yeah, they would. They drown babies and they just eat the tongues. And that's it. Well, Shamu drowns babies. Can't trust yeah. Shamu. Yeah. Never trust Shamu. Do you have a favorite line, Tom? Um, actually, I mean, it, if I could cheat, it's... Uh, Three lines at the end of the chapter. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna cheat. Do it. Um, it's uh, God does God does not give language to newborns immediately, and that's no accident. They still know the secret of paradise, but they have no words for it. When they are given language, the secret has already been forgotten. I feel like teaching my son a crazy language that doesn't really exist. Yeah, I've considered that. It's a good idea, right? I mean, like I said, I considered it pretty confident my wife talked me out of it pretty confident someone's going to talk you out of it so you know <laughs> hey i'm, in dreams, I'm trying my friend to, in dreams i'm trying you to speak little, you could teach him you could teach him an alternate history in which michigan state has won every ncaa championship for the last five years <laughs> uh, uh, no i, I <laughs> he's going to end up learning a wholly different language as i try and pronounce latvian words incorrectly time again and never can remember any of them so It'll happen by 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 just by happenstance. But do you have a favorite line, Brian? Um, I basically already read that passage. I, I really like, enjoyed the part about d dead dinosaurs dying again because of the 
atrocities yeah. of mankind. The one I that I, I marked. Throw, are... I, I could throw one more on. I really like. I really do love that bullet line in the mm-hmm. oh, section. Yeah. And that one, just that image is just amazing. Absolutely amazing. It's funny. I was reading this book on grammar, and this guy says that uh, we must think of the period as a full stop. And like with the bullet being a full stop. That made me mm-hmm. think of that when I was reading that. That's true. Mine sort of ties together some of the things we've been talking about. It's on 162. Funny that socialism and vegetarianism don't go together, like yogurt and fish. <laughs> I was looking for that when we were talking about fish earlier. Yeah. <laughs> what I also love is that like in the midst of this whole, th- that whole narrative about his father being a vegetarian and getting questioned and then getting pulled in front of the police and questioned and all that, <laughs> that oh, yeah. line is a paragraph unto itself. And it it's it, everything else. It's just this, <laughs> this complete one-liner that he just throws in there. Just be like, ah, screw it. Here's a one-liner. And then like continue the narrative. It's, it's just so, true. so good. So good. Masterful. It really is. So thanks everyone for joining in this week. Um, and next week we're going to go over chapter part six, the story buyer, which goes from page 179 to I believe 200 exactly. Yeah. And we will be <clears throat> doing things a little bit different. Um, We'll have the we'll set up the the YouTube uh, live podcast bit, but it'll probably be Brian and I just talking for a few minutes because we're going to have to talk to the translator next week, Angela Rodell, at a different point in time. She lives in Bulgaria, and the time difference doesn't work well for this um, much at all. <laughs> you don't want to talk to us at uh, five in the morning? Come on, four in the morning, three in the morning. It's like it's just it's all wrong. Like it's yeah. just wrong. So we're going to try and do that separately, um, and that'll be part of the podcast. So everyone that's listening will be able to hear it there. But we may just talk a little bit about like a build up into that conversation. So stay tuned. We have it all set up. It'll you'll still be able to have the link. You'll still be able to ask questions and make comments, um, like you did this week. Which thanks again. And I guess go Texas Tech is uh, I suppose a way to end this. Since Tom and and behalf of Tom Roberts. Um, otherwise, I don't have anything to say except that you can order the book through openletterbooks.org. And if you use the code two month at checkout, you'll get 20% off. Or better yet, why don't you go to Volumes and buy it at Volumes or go on B- Volumes website and buy it from Volumes? That's the That'd way to do fantastic. it. Fantastic. Get that. Get every book that we've covered on this series. Listen to the podcast. Tell your friends to listen to them, rate them, and just buy a ton of books from Volumes this week. And if you're, everyone should buy one book from you guys. Yeah, and if you're in the Chicagoland area, uh, April 26th, we've got Rodrigo Frazan at Volumes. Um, it'll be a great event. We're really looking forward to it. And with uh, Rachel, if you, if, with Rachel Cordasca. And if you are not in the Chicagoland area, you know someone who is. So tell them to show the hell up. Uh, you know, like I don't. Know, this is the spiel I give at the start of most events. Like if you want, if you want open letter to survive, if you want bookstores to survive if you want choice and what you read to survive occasionally you do have to buy a book from us so like <laughs> buy it from chad buy it from me buy it from whomever but you know if you're listening to this you're, i'm preaching to the choir but these are the cliff notes to hit your next yeah. friend who you know raves about all the things they downloaded for a penny on their kindle that's all Tell them to buy a book. If everyone listening to this podcast bought one book from Volumes this week, that would be spectacular. And yes, I would. I would cry a little bit more than a there little. There you bit. go. Do it. Let's make Tom cry. I mean, it's not that hard, but you know, go for it. Let's <laughs> let's see if you can make it happen. Do it. Watch okay. That, watch, that I'm that ordering a book right watch that baby get killed by a whale. You'll cry. I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Wow. <laughs> Bye, guys.